start off with some obvious thank yous, maybe some not so obvious, and then I have a few things I'd like um, to say in connection with the title of this slide. I like this slide so much, it's kind of a shame to even go to the other slides. I think this one's fun. What a great meeting. Uh, lots of thank yous. My whole family is here. Thanks for being here. Some traveled long ways. Um, thank you all for being here. Jay and I are still just really astonished uh, at the power of these ideas whose time, I've told many of you, has obviously come. Thank you to, and we need to stop right now and thank the all of the volunteers. I don't know, I see Mindy and Casey. Where's Megan? Really, this, these ideas are what they are, but this meeting does not happen without the staff that put this all together. So thank you all. I think if 20 or 30 more people come next year, I don't know that this is big enough, but we'll stay tuned. I have some prepared remarks and I'll, I'll get through these. Um, I'd like to talk for a few minutes about understanding and engaging the free market naysayers. Uh, I pre pretend to be no no great debater or polemicist, but having been subjected directly to the practice spitballs of the naysayers for several years now, I wanted to pass along my thoughts and experiences dealing with the various naysayers and the opponents of medical freedom and liberty in general. I want to cover the most important point first, self-preparation. Then we'll talk about the various types of naysayers, followed by some general strategy I've found useful, and then wrap up with some of the most common objections to medical free markets. What about the poor as an objection deserves, deserves special attention, so we'll save it for last. Our worst enemy, after all, in engaging all the naysayers is, after all, ourselves. Together, our own ignorance or unacknowledged philosophical inconsistencies are red meat for the naysayers armed with nothing but an agenda. We must first look within ourselves to prepare for any changes that might come, any challenges that might come our way. There are many examples, fortunately, of individuals who were self-prepared or taught the lessons of self-preparedness from whom we can learn. This kid's obviously one, right? It might seem strange to begin with Oscar Wilde. Yuri last night talked about Churchill, who lived on quips. I love the Russia's the only country with an unpredictable past, and Churchill had Churchill had many quips, but. Wild is thought of by many people as uh, the greatest quippist of them all, uh, it, perhaps the most incisive conversationalist that uh, many people believe ever lived. It seems strange to start with Wild in a way um, because many of us in here would disagree with him on many things, but he provides a great example for how to be prepared for the naysayers. In addition to his brilliant wit, he was, he was the author of many, many put-downs that were great one-liners. But this guy was fearless. He wrote books that he knew would land him in jail. One of my favorite Oscar Wilde quotes is, what you think of me is, after all, none of my business. Another great wild quote is, nothing succeeds like excess. He said that while he was drunk on absinthe. Do you have any fear that you harbor unspoken ideas 
that if discovered would earn you a tinfoil hat from the establishment. Fearlessness of being discovered emerges from addressing ourselves, both our ignorance and our inconsistencies, allowing them to square off in our own minds before we face a naysayer. You will know that someone is a true friend when you can safely discuss these ideas, ideas about which you will likely disagree. But always remember Wilde's most famous quote, be yourself. Everyone else is taken. <laughs> Leonard Reed has a large influence on me. Uh, his writings had a large influence on the construction of the partnership agreement at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. He's the author of two books uh, that had a particular influence on me and anybody else that's ever read them, anything that's peaceful, which is basically a description of the non-aggression principle that many people in this room I know subscribe to. And then elements of libertarian leadership, uh, parts of which are definitely codified in the partnership agreement at our facility. As the founder of the uh, Foundation for Economic Education, he reserved, he reserved his energies not only for the spreading of uh, liberty ideas, but in assisting others in educational effectiveness strategies. Reed's wisdom can be summed up as follows. Never bludgeon others with your views. Those who, val who see value in what you say, those who see you as a beacon, they will come to you on their own as you continue to educate and improve yourself. Reed proposed that if your views are coercive or their implementation requires laws or violence, then there is essentially no market for them, and they are, well, no good. After reading Leonard Reed and these two works, I realized that the market is always at work. You're either in sync with it and experiencing its bounty, or you're attempting to thwart the market and only experiencing its harsh discipline. Price controls cause shortages, period. Just because you don't believe in the laws of gravity or economics does not mean they are not at work. Some of the writings of Leonard Reed will help you stay grounded when you encounter a naysayer. This is Frederick Bastiat, for those of you all that don't recognize his picture. The most useful liberty proponent with regard to self-preparation for the naysayers is this professional and expert arguer, Frederick Bastiat. He made a habit of devastating the socialist and liberty naysayers in the mid-19th century. He feasted on them. His writings form an essential playbook on identifying and responding to logical fallacies, something he, as an attorney, fully understood. Thinking of Bastiat's writings, or think of his writings as a jihad on the collectivists. He said, for instance, to oppose government support of the poor does not mean I oppose the poor. This and other of his observations points out the coercive nature of many do-gooders, the vast majority of which in whom provide no direct help to the poor at all. Bastiat's abundance and scarcity, the first of his economic sophisms, provide you with all you need to disarm the naysayer by agreeing with them about the motives of the producer or businessman while in a classic Bastiat jiu-jitsu move, you can show how only free markets can protect the consumer from even the worst motives of unscrupulous sellers. There are countless other resources and writings that I could list of Bastiat and many others, many of which, and many of these writings have probably affected many of you in this room, but I think I've made my point. Prepare yourself first. First and foremost, 
Now let's talk about the two types of naysayers. There are actually three. I won't give the third one much time, but I'll mention them. This is Karl Marx, for those who don't know. All of the slides are bordered in black, except this one, it's bordered in red. And he was a commie after all, so we call it committed. Two types of naysayers, they're the committed ones. They're the ones that actually believe the collectivist lie. Marx is first and foremost. There's actually hope for these misguided souls, however, as deep down, many of them truly and genuinely want what's best for the needy, a goal that we all know can only be met by free markets. Our goals with the genuine naysayers should be a conversion of sorts, an impossibility, however, in one sitting. It is important to keep in mind we should never initiate conversion therapy in these folks. They must approach you or throw the first punch. I've encountered many patients um, who the individuals in this room would accurately characterize as le leftists or collectivists, anti-free market folks, who have seen firsthand that cheaper and better at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma has been served up to them by the capitalist system they have up until that point in their lives despised. If medical services are indeed subject to market discipline, what services are not? This is the very tough philosophical dilemma the socialist faces when partaking of honestly priced, high quality care at the facilities controlled by the pillars inherent in, the, in this organization. Also keep in mind the gift of any uncertainty that you can provide them. If a genuine socialist, if a genuine naysayer is forced to face responses to which their predetermined narrative does not apply, they'll perhaps be a little less or a little less likely or able to savage someone in the future with an argument which you've adroitly challenged. These folks can be dealt with on an individual basis, but never in groups. The older the socialist, the older the naysayer, the more difficult their transition is they have so much more to unlearn and likely more pride attached to the ideas, many of which have shaped their lives. The disingenuous. Liars, trolls, deceivers, hustlers, ayatollahs, unscrupulous brokers. We could go on. These folks are to be dealt with in groups, called out as the immoral syndicate that they are or that they represent. Their credibility should be the primary and singular target of any discussion or debate. Arguing with these fo folks about in particulars is pointless. Consider dealing directly with the individuals rather that they have damaged or duped, making only positive and optimistic points with them about markets. There is a third type of naysayer I'm going to get into a little bit more, one that is neither genuine or disingenuous, but rather nihilistic, such as a journalist armed only with an agenda to destroy your credibility if you ever find yourself in that situation, as I have. So some general strategy. So we've prepared ourselves, thinking through that. There are resources out there to help prepare you. We've talked about the types of naysayers, and here's some just general strategy. It's easy to see the disadvantage of the naysayer when you realize all they're armed with is fraud and violence. As there is no natural market for their misconceptions or outright abuses of others, they must attach coercion, lies, force, fear of imprisonment 
to non-compliance of their utopian vision for the rest of us. The naysayer is arguing against freedom and truth, arguing against the golden rule. These are tough positions and something to keep in mind. So smile. Be pleasant, smile. Watch YouTube videos of guys like Murray Rothbard, one of the most cheerful people who's just lobbing grenades in every other sentence. But a smile on your face. Truth and lack of fraud is on your side. Thomas Sowell, in a debate, once told his adversary that while he was entitled to his own opinions, he was not entitled to his own facts. The other Thomas Sowell quote I would encourage you to keep in mind, which will keep you smiling and keep you confident. He once said that we somehow can afford health care for everyone, but can miraculously afford health care for everyone plus a giant bureaucracy to administer it. You will know that the naysayer is struggling when they create a utopian straw man, as at this point they have completely surrendered reality. Smile. Socialists have conjured an image of capitalists as angry, rabid dogs, and your smile and laughter and lightheartedness will completely confound them. Be consistent. Be consistent in your words and deeds. A very sharp naysayer will seize on any inconsistencies they find, and we all have them. Don't make this easy for them. It is also easy to let your pride take over. Remember that the ideas, not the individuals involved, are the contestants in these debates and discussions. Now let's briefly talk about the third type of naysayer in the body of the strategy. Imagine that you're being interviewed by a nihilistic, completely rudderless individual, a journalist, with no philosophical keel, only an agenda to discredit you. I've been in that situation. I don't know if any of you others have. You probably, some of you probably have. And they say... So you think application of free markets is a good idea? Are there any areas of the the economy to which you do not believe markets apply? If so, how do you choose which ones and who decides? These are easy pickings for the agendaless naysayer. This exercise is a credibility-destroying one and not for the unseasoned. The best way to get through this is to say what you want heard, not necessarily answer the inquiry as each successive question is likely a trap. You can also say, I don't know, but I find the arguments presented by fill in the blank, compelling and then you can walk away. My friend Charlie Sauer once told me on a trip to DC right before I testified before some vicious goons to stick to what I know. He said, if they ask you about policy, remember you are not a policy guy. I have used that so many times. That's why I bring that up, partly to credit Charlie. It was so wise, but we... I'm a physician, I'm not a policy guy, and don't, don't hesitate to say, I don't know, I mean, it's not my expertise. I've been asked on a radio interview, what are your views about free market education or some other topic? And once I said, my views on that are as irrelevant as Gwyneth Paltrow's ramblings on politics. <laughs> Try very hard and I mentioned this in a discussion earlier, try very hard to monitor your position in the discussion, guarding against any position that is what I refer to as downstream of a flawed premise. You may find yourself arguing that free markets work and socialism or the syndicate brand of medical service delivery doesn't work, only to encounter the same response a two-year-old might give you, like, uh-uh, 
It won't take many conversations like this before you avoid what I refer to and mentioned earlier as the utilitarian's box. I like freedom because it works is an inferior argument and downstream of I like freedom because I want to be free. That markets work better is an afterthought. Avoid universalism. I would encourage each and every one of you to familiarize yourself with the speech that Jeff Deist gave in Malta. He actually gave it by Skype, where he talks in detail about universalism, where you cannot sleep at, lo- at night unless you think everyone agrees with you. This is perhaps the most powerful strategic point, as it will change you in the most astonishing way and will completely disarm any genuine socialist. It is okay for your adversary to harbor thoughts and ideas that are disagreeable, even disgusting to you. That they disagree alone is no reason to not engage them. That they want to inflict by force their views on you is an entirely different matter. If you genuinely do not care that a group wants to form a commune, if you genuinely do not care that a self-funded employer wants to support his brother-in-law who works for Blue Cross, you will be empowered in your magnanimity. It is best to reject an urge to crusade against all who disagree with you. Freedom is a good idea. That is the nuclear option. And it's nuclear because you must be careful. You must be careful if you say this because it will cause more self-examination than many people are willing to entertain. I like freedom. I think it's a good idea. Leave me alone. Mind your own business. These are effective Points, but they will once again truly challenge you if you go down this road to re examine and unlearn much of what you know, and it will make you face freedom in a way that might actually make, make many people uncomfortable. The disingenuous, and I I meant to write unscrupulous broker naysayers, but if you are a naysayer and you're a broker, you are unscrupulous. So I just to shorten the title of the slide. If this sounds harsh, it's because some of the following objections are some that I've not only heard, but from which this movement and the Surgery Center of Oklahoma personally have suffered. These objections have been successful and we must be able to respond to these and others that ooze out of the tropical golf retreats many of these frauds attend. How do you respond to this? Doctors will do unnecessary surgery if all out-of-pocket is waived. Here's how I respond. Everyone wants unnecessary surgery, don't they? Or how is your current utilization strategy working out? How are the bukas, how are they working with you to keep utilization down? How's that working? How about this? I risk losing my reputation and all of my business if it is discovered that a surgeon performs just one unnecessary surgery at my facility. How's that for utilization accountability? One Oklahoma City employer had more procedures than normal the first year they came into into an agreement with the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. They had more procedures. There was more utilization. And the broker and the carrier seized on that. Fortunately, this was an educated employer who pointed out to them that in spite of the increase in surgeries and the increase in utilization, 
which obviously was because these were deductible levels many of the employees could not meet, and so suddenly they found these surgeries that they or their children needed accessible. They pointed out that they spent $1 million less, actual dollars less, than the year before, in spite of the utilization. That's why I wrote, catch me next year, how about that? So, I hope you all understand where that came from. <laughs> as, I, um, as I said, the employer that fortunately was, a, was very educated and knew how to respond to this. I also mentioned in the Q&A earlier that we, I make a habit now of telling any employer or TPA with whom, with whom we work on behalf of an employer that we view ourselves as uninvited co-fiduciaries of their plan assets. Because after all, if at the end of the year they don't have a good experience, then the relationship's tenuous at best. You're not going to save any money at those fees. Let's talk about conjured fee schedules. I've seen carriers construct fee schedules on fancy brochure, brochures that back up their claim that employers will not save money utilizing the fees at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. There's just a problem. They're a fabrication. Conjured fee schedules are an attempt by the unscrupulous broker and the PPO to render market pricing a ripoff. A hospital that performs no pediatric surgery will gladly agree to a contract that includes sub-market pay for pediatric surgery. And gathering these prices from all over the country, assembling them into one fee schedule as if it were obtainable at one facility, provides the unscrupulous naysayer the opportunity to declare market pricing a price gouging assault. Poor quality and you get what you pay for. We hear that a lot. These two are sorted together. High prices, it turns out, just signal a lack of competition, not extremes in quality particularly in a non-functioning market. Low prices signal the presence of competitors. That wonderful activity, competition, it's in, in this industry as in all others, it simultaneously lowers prices and increases quality. I used to think there was no relationship between price and quality, and now we have data, and the Healthcare Blue Book people can back me up on this, there's absolute data that shows there is a relationship between price and quality. It is inverse. And this is why the lower the prices are, the more likely is there are competitors in the marketplace and quality goes up. My response to the quality lie is what I just mentioned, but it's also this. My waiting room at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma is full, and I'm not on any plans. I'm not on any plans that artificially feed my practice. I'm also not a hospital employee, so I'm not receiving referrals in spite of quite possibly being a butcher and a fraud. The carriers won't allow this. You heard Jay Kempton talk about the bolt-on concept earlier. Um, now I believe there are employers uh, in the United States that have just simply X'd out uh, the, the clauses and contracts that preclude them from de dealing directly with facilities like mine. So we dealt with the, the spitballs of the people who really believe this stuff, with the one giant exception, what about the poor, which we'll end with. These are the beginning of the spitballs of the true believers. 
Free markets, after all, provide more powerful regulation than anything the statists could imagine, as bankruptcy replaces the statists' fees and fines. Producers in a free market would have competitors, unlike producers in a corporate state, where monopolies are auctioned off in the political cesspool to the highest bidders. Poor products or service in a true marketplace would disappear as fast as they appeared, like restaurants serving poisonous food. Those who beg for regulations will receive even more cartelization of the industry as the industry giants invariably write the regulations in such a way that compliance is only possible if you are one of the industry giants. Buyer beware. Most buyers, contrary to popular belief, that I meet at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma are astonishingly well-educated and versed, even in the medical marketplace. Patients can smell a rat. They're pretty good at it. Price transparent physicians and facilities, or those who are actually honest about pricing, are shockingly more likely to be honest in the delivery of care that people need. This dynamic naturally draws those buyers with sticker shock to sellers of high value. I won't spend much time on scope of practice, but you should think through your views on the licensure debate. How far are you willing to go? You need to think through where you are on what role government has in any, if, if any, in regulating scope of practice issues. It is okay, after all, and I bring it up for this reason, for people in this room to disagree. My views are probably considered radical by many of you, but it is okay for us to disagree, but you must think through this because this is one of the favorite topics of the naysayers. There's a role for government and licensure after all. There is a role for regulation. You should think through that because this, if you're ever across particularly one of these nihilistic rudderless journalists, this is one of their favorite, favorite places to bite. The free market doesn't work in an ambulance. Eh, how many of you have heard that? I mean, you hear this all the time. How can you buy health care when you're unconscious in an ambulance? The market can work in an ambulance. As the credibility of a hospital can and should be destroyed if they prey on the vulnerable. A hospital could actually make a reputation by treating the vulnerable particularly favorably. And this can be known before you become unconscious or what other, whatever other malady conjuring the naysayer might employ. While you are not an active shopper when you are unconscious, that you have been financially roofied by a hospital will eventually get around. Ruining that hospital's reputation, particularly if their competitors' dealings are more consensual. We'll finish with, what about the poor? This is absolutely the most common. Gosh, when I was in Oregon and visiting with Jack and Kathy Brown, everywhere I go, talk about free markets, and somebody stands up, what about the poor? This is absolutely the most common. Here are some responses that I found useful. One is from my partner, Dr. Steve Lantier who recently said, we're all poor at these prices. <laughs> or my dad's. Someone says, what about the poor? The appropriate response might be, what are your intentions? And then I'll tell you mine. This question reveals the awkward fact that the person asking the question, after all, has no intention of contributing to a solution, meaning for you to bear the burden of whatever they conjured in their head yourself alone. Here's another. 
Which poor? And what about the poor? Which poor? Just in this country? Why limit it? Why not the planet? Why not the universe? Maybe that's why they call it universal care. I mean, (laughs) which poor? The other important distinction is to make absolutely sure when someone says, what about the poor, you are able to entertain the idea of them only as individuals, not in the aggregate. If we are going to consider the poor in the aggregate, we must consider the aggregate bounty created by what everyone in this room is doing and the extent to which that empowers us all to be more charitable. All of the massive savings must be taken into account on the other side of the ledger from the aggregate burden of the poor. Aggregation of the poor as a problem begs for a system answer. However, in the poor deserve better, I think. I believe that a system answer, one which invariably will line the pockets of the venture socialists, is not how we should address the problem of the poor. I will also say, what about the poor is a bit of a straw man question, because there will always be poor amongst us. The question is, do we want more of them or do we want less? If prices fall and medical care becomes more affordable, don't we have fewer medical financial cripples? Finally, cancel your vacation. I'm sick. This is the honest translation of the property rights violation that is government or universal health care. Describe the family headed to Disneyland or to next year's FMMA conference, all packed and ready, and now they can't go, as disappointing as the kids might be, because some idiot doing a wheelie on his motorcycle crashed. And someone else must pay, since he has nothing and no insurance. This money doesn't grow on trees. It comes out of the pocket of regular folks. We started with preparing yourself, and I can, I'm thinking of the closing that was provided to us by the brilliant Jeff Deist last year in his keynote address. And this quote from Albert J. Nock, I think, is a fitting ending because it reminds us once again the most important task in preparation for these duels that you will invariably find yourself in is to prepare and improve yourself. Thank you once again for attending.